Uh, we have Matilda here who is going to be giving us our next talk about communal computing. Uh, I, uh, she, she deliberately chose it for the alliteration. She's actually going to be speaking in rhyme the entire time, which is going to get very grading very fast. But it's going to be cool like a Dr. Seuss book, so I, I really appreciate that. Um, uh, really excited to have her talk. She's been with us this whole time, just chilling and hanging out at the village, helping every way, any, any way she can. This is, her, this is her time to shine. She's been watching other people, other speakers this entire time, and she's been anxiously awaiting the day, but her day has finally come. So please give her a hand as she comes on stage. And let's go ahead and hear what you have to say about communal computing. Ah, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank the Critical Decentralization Cluster for having me here. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen the other talks, if you've been at home, or if you're watching it streaming or here. There's been some really good ones. My favorite one so far has been the one where Namecoin talks about uh, their time integrating with Tor, because I think it really points out uh, the mission that all these disparate projects can work together and leverage uh, their approaches and technologies together in a way that sort of benefits them. Uh, and I really want to do that today. Um, so yes, my name is Matilda Park. I'm a software developer. I am working on Urbit, which is a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, entirely from scratch. I will explain what that means and also uh, you know, what that actually changes about the way we think about interfaces, which is why we're here today. So communal computing. I like to argue today that peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks and peer-to-peer -peer technologies cannot really make interfaces in the same way that we've been used to uh, in terms of using computers. Um, that is to say that it opens up a whole new world and a whole new way of thinking about uh, user interface in general. So. I want to describe what single-player computing is. That's to say that uh, you know, they they say that every uh, box is either a Unix box or it's pretending to be a Unix box, and that really comes down to how Unix is based around uh, time sharing, and a combination of later on the Macintosh they integrated the desktop metaphor. So time sharing is when uh, a big supercomputer has a whole lot of thin clients or monitors, and by allocating free cycles accordingly, it can let everyone pretend that that computer is their computer. Uh, yeah, made for multiple users in one machine, centered around time sharing cycles across single user sessions. So everyone has a single user session on one machine, and by allocating those cycles, they all pretend it's theirs. But this also replicates in the client server relationship. That is to say, the relationship between your computer and that computer you connect to. Because uh, essentially, it changes the way even the hardware gets manufactured, because it becomes very easy for users to just abstract it away to, to some other company to do basic tasks, like storing photos or t talking to their friends. But it also heavily limits sort of what they expect from a specific program. Um, <clears throat> so when we're talking about decentralization, it's not just like a, like a buzzword or like a, a you know, a rah-rah team that's good thing. It's like, it's about going away from central command structures and toward direct empowerment of individuals to, to find each other and to work together. But I think so far, the, the steps we've been taking have been working toward a modular approach, building on top of the, the current stack in such a way that while it allows for agency on a small scale, like these small teams of people can get a lot done, um, it actually hides away a larger problem as we get toward lower level decentralization. Um, so. Essentially, when you're talking about a centralized platform, you're talking about single clients to single function computers. And it also influences the fact that we expect there to be an account that we log into for everything we do that does one thing and that doesn't know about every other machine we have. And the more a specific company uh, bases their business model around this concept, the more they're incentivized to make thinner clients on the hardware side. So you'll see that, you know, if you're Apple, you'll start making MacBooks that have less hard drive space because you want them to use iCloud, because it's just a better user experience across all the devices today. Or if you're you know, Google, you want Chromebooks, which are the thinnest clients of all. But essentially, it becomes increasingly difficult to not participate in this process of abstracting away basic computer functionality to these giant services that want to monetize basic usage, even though you can do this on your own computer. Like, we've long since gone past the time where you, you should be using a thin client to a big Boeing 737. It's like you want 
you want to be able to just use the things that you're doing on your computer directly with other people in a way that's sane and can, uh, can be easy to use both for you, but also for, for, for finding other people. So, so far, I want to talk about two things, two different decentralized products or federated products that I actually really like. And that while they do have a really good UX, I think they made some trade-offs that point to the fact that we're creating deeper level decentralization that will increase uh, the sort of challenges available to us. So, essentially, the first one is uh, Mastodon or the Fediverse. I use that every day. It is actually a really great experience. They've uh, recently solve the problem of migration between instances, which I think is actually really brilliant. Um, it's just a federated social network, so it does one thing. It does it very well with a very good user, uh, user experience, but it abstracts it away to a landlord model. So instead of using one big supercomputer, you're using your, your, your local admin supercomputer, and you're trusting them with everything in that sliver of your digital life. Um, likewise, with Scuttlebutt, Scuttlebutt is another, uh, it's a social network that is fully peer-to-peer, but it trades it off with the fact that there is not an external verification store for their identities. So every single time you create uh, an account on your computer, it's a new person. And you have to, like, once you have more than one machine, you're, you have to make a new identity with a new little parenthetical comment to find the same people over again. Um, okay. The lesson that we learned from this is that the internet right now, in the clear net, as a system does not really direct, uh, directly incentivize direct ownership. Uh, it's very easy, and it's actually every step of the way, you're highly encouraged to abstract your online life into this model and just accept the trade-offs. Like, but as we know, when we first, going on the, when we first we used the internet, you know, for most people it was Usenet before or after September 1993, uh, it was about sort of making communities together, directly connecting with each other, and doing things together with our computers and like an intranet somewhere around interest groups or whatnot. So, a bit about what I do. Uh, I work on Urbit, which takes a systematic approach. It creates a full stack to construct itself around a peer-to-peer -peer network. We essentially branched off com computational history around the time of Unix and sort of built the incentives and every single part of the stack around sort of current use cases uh, for what humans want to do together. That is to say, to cultivate and facilitate small communities to do things with their computers directly in a way that where they can find each other uh, on the network very quickly with a consistent namespace. They can assume goodwill on the part of everybody because you all have a, st like a stake in the network success. Um, and it makes uh, everyday computers understandable. It, it, can, it constrains the complexity to a stack that one person can understand, which if, if, if the more you know about computers, the more you might think that that's like an incredible feat, I think. It, because uh, essentially, it, you know, Linux uh, is about 30 million lines, the last I ever heard. Um, so the core goal is to use the internet, like the internet use phone lines, basically, to, to make, make it so that there isn't like a client and a server, but everyone is a client and a server. That your machine and my machine are just uh, finding each other and doing things, uh, you know, like ap applications are just sort of files and uh, these contexts are just uh, arranged around the consistent groups of people as opposed to like me and you and the 50 other people we know are spread across WhatsApp and Messenger and Line and wherever, you know, some other service owns them. Uh, yeah, so essentially the best way to think about it is that it's a really well-permissioned, well-structured peer swarm uh, that has really made it easy to, to find other people and do things with them. But what does that mean for the user interface, essentially? Because if everyone is running their own computer and speaking directly to each other, you have to plan your UI around a wide net of small groups because it's not so easy to just aggregate all the data you have. It's not very easy to see everybody's information, even if they're making it public. Like, you really are only aware of the peers that you're connected to directly on a peer-to-peer -peer network. And so you can't build like an upvote system on Reddit very simply. It just won't scale. Like the more people that are there, the harder it is to do. Um, what ends up happening is that it's actually very good at working at a wide net of small groups of people. Such that you can essentially opt out of the rest of the internet if you want to and only really talk to your friends and be in a private cave where no one can see, can see what you're doing. That like everything you say isn't on the public record. That like, you know, uh, whatever I might want for breakfast might not be on a Jack's phone the next day. I don't know. But how do you build for a community outside of a single context application then? 
because centralized interfaces have essentially built around the fact that I'm going to have one account on a multiple user computer that's going to have us all sign into it and do one thing where we're entering records into a database. That is essentially any centralized service right now. So how can you build a product where you can do basically anything so long as you can permission a file and an application with other people? Well, the best way we've really thought to do it is with a top-level primitive of a group or a peer list or some sort of consistent list of people where you, you, you can say, you know, these machines of, of these names, I want them to have the same permissions across every file that we share together because really the network is just like a shared directory with different views into that directory. And making a, a shared desktop of file contexts, that is to say, ways of reading and writing file types. Um, the best way to think about this right now is that there are a few services that are centralized doing this right now. Uh, you know, Discord or Slack, they, they're built around the group as the highest level primitive. But they are used to do one thing, to chat mostly. And if you're doing uh, Matrix also, that's a federated network, but they also are built on communities where you are first filtering by the group of people and then seeing the things that belong to that group. But what I've, what I've found when I use Discord myself is that I'm around a lot of communities that say they'll have like a library room and they'll dump like PDF links and, or like a, a big spreadsheet of links to a Google Drive full of, uh, of books that they want to talk about. And we'll just have to like deal with the fact that everything we're doing is based around that list of things as opposed to like, you know, just sharing an interface together. So if you can't guarantee that everyone has the same UI because it's your computer, you basically have to permission and define read and write permissions with, with file types per group so that your group has an agreed upon definition for what, how to access a text file or how to access an image. And then defining that as the group's shared data structure such that like, these become contextual components. Uh, this lets the individual or the group shape an inherited interface from an extensible co component library such that a chat becomes like a, a file type or like, you know, an image becomes like a certain way of viewing it with a certain sort of like uh, RGB sort of, uh, I can't remember the word for that, but like if you want to add like a slider as a U ID3 component to your MP3s, you should be able to do that, right? So what we would say is that a peer-to-peer -peer interface demands target agnostic extensible components for file types. So what does that mean? Uh, it means like no matter what machine you're on, you want to have different interfaces available for reading and writing those files in similar ways on the back end, but displaying them in different ways for different interfaces. But you also want them within specific shared application contexts because each different way you're looking at these files will depend on the group. And as designers and user space developers, we really hope to learn together how to really solve this problem uh, in the peer-to-peer -peer space uh, because you know it's a brave new world, essentially. So yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, I think we have one minute. No? Yeah, we can take we can take a question if you want. You have to get a mic to you though. Nope. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Matilda, thank you for giving this third to last speech.